Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm delighted to be joined by writer and director Lisa Azuelos to talk all about her latest feature film, I Love America. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the writing process for this film because it came from a very personal space for you and, and was something where it sounds like you started writing not even with the intention of creating a film at first, but just writing certain emotions and feelings on the page. And I was interested in what was the turning point and what was the moment at which it started to take on more of a narrative structure and you started to really see this as a film um yeah you're right in the beginning you know I came in in the states it was September 2019 and I wanted to stop my life I didn't know that lockdown would uh, do it better than I would <laughs> and uh, I really didn't want to write anything I wanted to you know live life in a way that's like free so then I can pick up things to write a movie because, you know, when you're a writer, I always write from a very personal perspective, but um, sometimes you just need to live a free life without thinking, oh, that would be great for a movie or that's going to be in a movie, or, you know. So I just wanted to chill and everything. And then my mom died and then it was, you know, unexpected. And also my uh, gay friend who was uh, my best friend in LA he said okay you need to go on tinder and those two combos begin to mix in my head like wow that's such a such a different uh, vibration but such a such a related vibration mm -hmm. and then suddenly I was journaling and it became I, I did dialogues and then I said oh my god this is a movie <laughs> I can't help <laughs> you know and, and you're talking there about you know, within the storyline, there's the moments of your main character starting to date. There's some comedic elements that come with that. And then there's also, you know, processing grief with the loss of her mother within the film as a character as well. And so tonally, you you capture this very real space, which is some days are difficult, some days are hard, some days life feels a little stagnant, and sometimes things feel very alive and there's a lot of levity. Was it important to you to capture that, that full true landscape and, and that broad spectrum of emotions throughout the film? Yeah, this is for me, the, the reason why I'm doing movies is to help people go through emotions that sometimes they don't have time to process. And I kind of have that time because it's also my job, you know, and it's also my passion. It's to, you know, uh, make it possible for people to go through their emotions through mine, through my truth, they find theirs. And this is why I do movies, basically. Otherwise, I would be a psychiatrist or something like that. But on a large scale, I'm just doing movies. And the problem is I can't help doing comedy because this is where I come from. And I think that comedy is the best way to say unbearable things, you know, because otherwise it's too heavy and you don't want people to feel too sad or to go through too deep emotions. When they go it through the laugh, then they're like, oh, I've laughed on something that hurts me. And then suddenly there's an alchemy in your body and your mind and your spirit that makes things alive again. And, um, you know, you never laugh as much as when you're on a funeral, you know, you have some laughing moments, you're like, oh, my God, this is a funeral, but I, I laughed. But it's, it's okay, you know, because emotion expresses by tears, by laughter, by, you know, just contemplating, it's very different emotions. And I think in a one hour and a half movie, you can go through many different emotions, and it's still the same tone and the same tune which is a love tune that's why also there is the word love in the title of the movie I love America and and with you talking there about the comedy in some of the the harder moments as well one of the scenes that comes to mind is even just the moment early on in the film where she finds out that her mom is passing and she's just arrived in LA and she's in the middle of a Halloween party party dressed as a playboy bunny um does it come quite naturally to you to find that space where you know she's going through something very traumatic hearing this news and yet at the same time there's also a real comedic element all in the same instance well truth is it really happened to me i was in the streets in new york not in la and i have this phone call from my sister and everybody, you know, I was going to a party, to a Halloween party, because it's it's the day of Halloween. And everybody's dressed like dead people. And, you know, uh, the scenery around me is ghosts and cemeteries and, you know, in the shops and every. And then I have this strange phone call saying, OK, basically, this is the moment where you're going to say bye bye to mom when she's really conscious. And I was like, if I put this in a movie, nobody was, will think it's possible. You know, this is. This, this is like something that God is helping me with the scenery around 
to, you know, to help me cope with this emotion because everybody's going through death right now with me. And also that was comic, you know, that was so funny that it was that precise moment. And also it's very spiritual because this is the birthday of my grandfather, the father of my mom. And she always said she wanted to die the day of her, the birthday of her father. So it was all of an, all of, all at once. I said, this is too much. I have to put this like it in the movie. And talking a little bit as well about the relationship that, that your lead character, Lisa, has with her mother in the film, there's so many moments where we get these little flashbacks to childhood and, and really see what that dynamic was. And it's something where she spent her whole life wanting to have a stronger connection to her mother, to feel seen and to feel noticed. How did you determine when you were writing the, the script um, where you wanted to have these moments? Because it always relates to something that she's going through in the present. It's basically, you know, I used to do a lot of um, structure when I was writing a, a, a screenplay. And lately I've been doing with my hands and my hands are directly related to my heart and I don't structure anymore. In the beginning, I told you I was just writing and not even writing a movie. And then it became a movie. And then the movie came with flashbacks, which I hate usually in movies, you know. And then suddenly there's a voiceover and I hate voiceovers. But, you know, I'm not the one doing it. I'm just the passage from my emotions to the script. And I'm trying not to block it with, no, this I can't do. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This is not how I, I was taught to write. You know, I just let my hands write directly connected with my heart because I was very sensitive at that time, of course. And, um, and it just worked out like that. Then there's another writing that we never talk about, which is the editing. So, of course, usually I try to, you know, when I do flashback, that it's easy for the audience to go in the flashback. Like you see a plane and then the little girl goes out of the plane. That's an easy flashback, you know, as a, a montage ed editing structure. But also sometimes, you know, with the editing, there is this miracle where you found connections that you didn't think you would do. And to help me with that, because now it's my eighth movie, so I'm kind of, you know, I know that I'm going to need things that have not been written in the script. I shot a lot of moments where she's writing on her computer, whether it's at the pool or on her bed or at the, the office or, you know, and that she looks somewhere. Sometimes she's happy, sometimes she's not. So I can use this footage when I need that to go back to a more reflecting point of view. I love that. And also with what you were saying about your relationship with the idea of flashbacks, um, how did that influence you deciding how you wanted those to look on screen? Because, you know, visually there's a little bit of a different kind of haze to the color palette in those moments. The camera feels a little bit more still in terms of the connection that it's bringing us into with the characters. Because, you know, it was shot in the 70s. So I wanted to have the 70s look, 70s, 80s. You don't film the same way. And it's a collaboration, of course, with my DP, you know, and I didn't want to go too sepia, too old fashioned, but I also wanted the audience to be able to know, oh, this is the flashback feeling vibe. And it's not just because it's written flashback. If you can feel it in the image, the sound and everything, then it's help, you know, going back in the memory, coming back in, in the now, you know, you need to help the audience a little bit too. And there's a couple of moments that that step outside of linear storytelling. And one of the ones that I was thinking of in particular is the scene where she has a lipstick that had belonged to her mother. And then there's a moment where, um, you know, we see her kind of like in a bathtub with things written on her body with that lipstick. What inspired that particular scene and the way that you were able to kind of carry us into that moment outside of the narrative structure of the film and, and then carry us back out completely seamlessly? It's um... You know, you're not going to believe me, but it really happened in my life. So I was feeling, you know, a little bit lonely in L.A., COVID. My mom just died. And so I go and see a psychic, like in the movie, because <laughs> I want to know, you know, what the hell is happening to me? And she says, well, uh, and I had, a, you know, I, I had gained a lot of weight and I wanted to lose weight. And I'm like, you know, can you help me with that? And she's like, you know, you're going to write on your body. I love me. I love you. I love you. I love you. I said, okay, but how? She says, well, you take some lipstick and you know, you just do it. And I'm like, okay. And then I come back home and I'm like, I'm never going to do that shit. You know, it's too weird. And then I don't know why I feel like I need to do it. And I have no lipstick. 
So I go in the bathroom and I see in my and I see in my in, in my drawer, and I see that you know one of the only thing I took from my mom is her lipstick, and I forgot it. And then I see the lipstick of my mom, and suddenly I realize that she's the one who's going to say I love you to my body, and this was a big big turnover. And I said, wow, wow, that's a great scene for the movie. But I would have never been able to want that scene, it just because it really happen in a very weird way that I had that scene. <laughs> One of the other visual elements that really stands out is, is as your character is going through online dating, looking at various profiles, we don't just hear her talking about the people that she's looking at on screen. We actually get to see those visual elements and you show them in different ways that there's a moment where she's sitting on her couch and, and it's projected onto the wall behind her, or it's a visual graphic kind of on the screen next to her while she's laying in bed, scrolling through her phone. Um, how did you come up with the different choices of how you wanted us to see that? And why was it so important to make it dynamic for the audience and to make us kind of connected to like all of the choices and even just all of the faces that she's looking at? Oh, that's, you know, you're the first journalist to ask me about that. And I'm so happy because I made a lot of, uh, it took me a lot of thoughts and nobody, everybody's always asking the same question. And this question is really interesting because, you know, it's not because you're looking at someone on the internet and you want to connect with them that you're in the same space in the real life, but also in your head. And this is what I wanted to show that, you know, sometimes on the wall, I was very sure that I didn't want, you know, the scrolling all the time and you can see a, a shot on the phone. That's super boring for an audience that's now, you know, I've seen Dune and special effects and Marvel. I mean, you need to bring them a little bit of, you know, spice in the special effects, even if it's a little comedy. So I wanted the wall because the wall, it's, you know, she's not into it, it's behind her. And then when she sees them, you know, on the disco ball, it's like the earth is, is going round like her, then so many people are connected in the same desire. And this is what I want. So I needed this to shine and to turn around her. And of course, there is normal scrolling where it's on, on, you know, on her side because that's easy. But uh, I really wanted to stay creative with that because it's part of the story. And was that, that idea of connection also what drove the scenes where she's calling her kids as well? Because again, we feel like we're getting to kind of enter the center of that conversation because we get to see both sides rather than seeing someone kind of over their shoulder where we're only seeing one person's face at a time in those conversations. We have too much life going on in our phones to just show the phones now. We have to, because when the people you know are on FaceTime, it's like they're with us in the room. You know, I live in L.A., my kids live in Paris. I have them on, on FaceTime like twice, three times, four times a week. When they're here, they're with me in my real space. So I think it's fair to, you know, I'm not a, such a great phone and Internet user. I kind of hate it. I'm like, like, connect to yourself, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes, you know, you connect. Even now we're on Zoom, but, you know, you're in my space. You're in L.A. with me, even though you're not. So I wanted to to show that sometimes you can feel people even when they're not here, because this is also the story of a, of a mother who left her kids in Paris, but this is another way to connect with people. And we, you know, we have to bless technology for that, that now it's possible to be away and still we'd be with the people. And the film's also a real, a real love letter to the States, but also Los Angeles in particular. And, and even the way that you introduce us to LA in the film at the beginning, it's referencing movies and, and cinematic moments that you've clearly kind of have, have been a conduit to you falling in love with the city. And so how did that influence the way that you wanted to film Los Angeles as a really central character to the film? I must admit, I, I kind of uh, was freed by Emily in Paris. Because Paris does not look like in Emily in Paris, you know. But I was like, you know, when you see Emily in Paris, I understand that, you know, Chinese people, American people, all around the world people, they're like, oh, my God, I want to go to Paris. This is so beautiful. It's super cheesy, but it works, you know. And I was like, well, I love L.A. for the same reason that these Americans love Paris. For me, L.A. is my Paris, you know, kind of romantic, beautiful, resourceful place. And I really was not afraid to be cheesy. I think that's the secret when you want to write a love letter to a city. Don't be afraid to go in all the cliche, be cheesy, show how much you love it in a very, you know, uh, sensitive way and people are going to feel it. 
And we also really get to experience the story and experience the film directly with your central character, with Lisa. And I, I thought it was so great the way that you bring us into the world in all the ways that you were just talking about. But when you have the camera focusing on her in the story, how did that influence a lot of the, the camera choices, the positioning, the shot choices that you were making? Mm, well, as I told you, I had a lot of... Um moment where she doesn't talk so each time the light was good and I have like five minutes left before wrapping I would shoot her in slow-mo walking you know looking at things etc etc because I know this footage can bring so much things within you know and then suddenly you connect with her and otherwise you know I'm trying to always be on her point of view and uh, that's the way you know that's the way you do it each time you you go out of this point of view then it's more difficult to people to relate to the main character. And I also wanted to talk about the relationship dynamic between Lisa and Luca in the film, because I, I love that you have another character who has lived out in LA, has made that move, has been there for a while longer. So there's ways in which he has like found a comfort with the city, he's built a life, and yet there's still moments where it's very new to him and things are still really difficult because they're different. Um, and so what are some of the parallels that you wanted these two characters to have with one another in just kind of struggling to find some of their day to day? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is what happened to me. I had this friend and I mean, I lived in LA 10 years ago, so I kind of had friends already. But this friend is very particular because he's French and he's been through things and we get along very well. And, you know, um, he was kind of a mentor and say, you know, this is how you do. And especially on the dating apps, you know, because he was obviously he was on on Grindr and Tinder and he knew, you know, it's been a long time that he's been using those dating apps when for me it was a little bit new. So he was like a dating mentor app person plus a L.A. LA mentor, but LA I knew, but it, it was more like how people react, how, you know, the emotional, sexual and dating uh, relationship in LA that he mentored me through. And did your friend also inspire the, the element of that character, which oh, yeah. has all of the drag club scenes as well, because I thought yeah. that was a beautiful exploration of the idea of family that you find for yourself, um, you know, and was that something that was really important for you to show through Lisa as a character that she's now on this journey of kind of building and creating her own family because her relationship with her parents didn't really ever give her that. Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, um, the word queer really, I don't even know, you, you don't translate it in French. It doesn't exist. You know, it's so I kind of entered the, the queer community very easy here because there is this vibe in LA. There is the thing of you can be gay or not or transgender or woman or a man or whatever. And everything is kind of mixed and nobody was going to judge you if you don't behave like you're supposed to behave in the 50s, you know. And I think in a lot of uh, countries and even in, in the like straight normal people, whatever they consider themselves. There's also very a lot of judgmental about how you behave, you know, just being a mother and leave your kids to live your own life as a woman is already queer, you know, is already something that people don't do. Usually mothers stay home, hoping that their kids are going to come back for a, a, a lunch on Sunday, you know, that's, that's what you're supposed to be as a mo mother, just going away and say, okay, now I'm going to have a love life, a sex life. I've gave, I've given your life. And now this is my time to enjoy, you know, my body, my spirit, my connection with another country, with other people, with a sexual, with sexuality. This is very new and modern. And it's just the very beginning. And I think that, you know, you can include people who just want to enjoy their sex, sexual life and their dating life as also queer, you know, because this is, this is very, very specific. And I've been very welcomed by the queer community here. And I felt this is my family. This is, this is why I felt like so weird when I was, you know, in Paris in the straight world and, you know, everybody's kind of judging me if I'm having this behavior or what. And suddenly I'm here and the, 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 the how do you say the I felt so free of being myself that this is the love letter that I, I do to LA I know that's for some people it's not the case but for me that's what happened 
I really love that. And, and also in the, in the making of the film, you know, it's always such a challenge making a film with such a limited amount of time and limited resources. There's never enough time. There's never enough money. What were the biggest kind of creative challenges or hurdles that came with those aspects of making this film? On top of the fact that there was not enough time as usual and not enough money, which, you know, I kind of, I've been a producer all my life. So I am very, very specific about my writing. Not more than three minutes I sh shoot, go to the garbage. I use everything I shoot because I hate when, you know, oh, we'll see at the editing room. Well, I don't have time and money for that. So I'm going to be very, very specific and very focused. But the worst thing I did was me doing this to myself was that I decided to film everything on sunset. So sometimes I had scenes that I could have five, five hours to make them. And I decided to shoot them like the Halloween scene it was supposed to be at night. I was supposed to have five hours. And then when I'm on site and, and I see that the street that, they, that we picked is directly on the sunset, that I'm going to have all this beautiful light. I'm like, I can't miss that. But it's, the DP says, well, you're going to have one hour instead of five. And I'm like, well, we're going to do it in one hour instead of five because it's worth it, you know? And then I began to do everything at sunset because it was so beautiful. The beach was supposed to be at night. Everything was supposed to be at night. But then I, I did everything on sunset for the love of sunsets. <laughs> I mean, it explains why there's so many beautiful shots in the film. I mean, congratulations on the movie and thank you so much for talking about it. Really appreciate it, Lisa. Thank you so much for all your great questions. Thank you.